We thank you, Father, for your presence that is here in this place. You are Jehovah Shaman. You are the ever-present one. We thank you for your presence that's here right now to meet our every need, to make a mark in our lives that can never be erased. You are Jehovah Shema right now, Lord. We just thank you that you are El Shaddai, the many-breasted one, the most high God. We lean in and we rely upon you. Thank you, Father, right now for your ability to heal, to set free, to make whole. In Jesus' name, Lord, we lift up our hands as a sign of surrenderance unto your plan and your purpose for our lives and for all the things that you have destined for us this day from the foundations of the world. We cooperate with heaven's agenda, with heaven's plan. Come thy kingdom, be done thy will on earth as it is in heaven. This is our receiving day. This is our receiving moment. We receive healing. We receive wholeness. We receive deliverance manifestation we receive your glory we receive your goodness we receive your presence wisdom right now we receive the joy of the Lord that is our strength unexplainable speakable joy full of glory Lord we thank you for that in Jesus name we thank you that we can come boldly to your throne of grace to receive everything that we need right now in Jesus name we thank you that we are the righteous and you made us right according to your plan and your purpose through and by that precious blood that gives us the right to stand in your presence, Father, to know that we have answers to our prayers and our prayers are heard and our worship is received right now and that you inhabit, you inhabit our worship. You inhabit us adoring you and just lavishing all the things that you made available for us right now. We thank you for that, Lord, being so good, so good, so good to us, Lord. You're so good, so, such a good Father. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We come praying for those who have authority over us. We pray right now and lift up our president. We lift him up to you, President Biden, Vice President Harris, governors of every state, mayors of every city, judges, congressmen, congresswomen, representatives, Father. We just declare that only the upright dwell in our government that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. You said that this is good and this is acceptable unto you. So we thank you for godly men and godly women right now that you have the heart of our president in your hand to fulfill your will according to your plan for these United States, Lord. We declare that you'll pull down the treacherous and the wicked and the upright you'll lift up, Father. We thank you that your hand is upon our leaders this day. And so we thank you, Father, right now in Jesus' mighty name. We lift up Creflo, the man of this house, and our spiritual father. We thank you for no weapons formed against him will prosper. We thank you for this vision to bring forth understanding. In all of our getting, we get understanding right now that wisdom is a principal thing. And so we thank you for the assignment we thank you for the grace, the anointing on every person, every leader, every director, every volunteer, every family, every member, every partner, every person connected to this vision and to this ministry, Father. We thank you for it. And we're so privileged to be able to serve and to carry out your vision in these United States and in this earth and in your, be a part of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' mighty name, the name that is above all names, the name upon which every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. We thank you for that name, that name that is higher than any name. We thank you for that name that brings everything under subjection this day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all that agree said, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> to God be the glory and to God be praised. Well, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Those of you who are here in person, we just want to thank you for coming out today and believe that you will be blessed and you will be encouraged by tuning in and carving out time for God's presence. And so we are excited. I'm excited about the um, teaching this morning. I believe that it will be a blessing to your life, things that... Uh, we must begin to walk in victory 
particularly in 2021. We know that there are so many things that are going on, but you know what? We have to prioritize God's purpose for our lives and to live in victory and not to live in defeat. And so this subject that I want to talk about this morning is a topic that in many instances the enemy has been able to kind of hide out in and cause strife, division, all kind of works of the flesh uh, because he dwells in darkness. And so when we understand the strategies, the schemes, the plans of the enemy, then we can shine light on it and we can... Um, live free from his uh, trap and his snare. And so I want to talk and continue on about making room. We started talking about this a uh, few weeks ago. But today we want to talk about making room by letting go. Making room by letting go. You know, sometimes we hold on to so many things. Uh, we can begin to even create memorials in our lives and landmarks of what happened and things that occurred. Um, it's wonderful to celebrate over things that are good and breakthroughs and manifestations, miraculous divine interventions, but then there's something very dangerous when we hold on to the bad and we don't let go and we don't begin to understand what it is that God has delivered us from. And so we want to focus in on this area of deliverance, this area of freedom, this ability that we have by God. You know, um, when we look at this so great salvation, we understand that it's not just being born again. Um, it's not just escaping hell or um, having the fact that, you know, we have heaven in our view, but it's also the fact that we understand that we have forgiveness and that God wants us to live, as the Bible talks about, pardon and free from uh, the past and free from holding on to things. And so we want to um, kind of begin today and look at this area. And uh, just as a foundation, the word salvation is defined as deliverance from slavery. It's a state of wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. Preservation of life, physical health, natural temporal deliverance from danger and apprehension, restoration and healing. And it also, what we wanna focus on today is pardon. Uh, the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins. Let's begin in Psalms 103. And we want to look at this area of forgiveness. And we will go as far as we can this morning. I just believe that I'm going to take my time so I can really allow the Spirit of God to speak and do what He wants to do. Because uh, we have to be intentional about this area of our life. Like I said, the enemy wants to hide out, and if we don't realize that there are areas in our life that we must evict people from living in our heads, then as a result, that intention, that plan will cease to operate in our life. So when we talk about intention, we're talking about a commitment to carry out an action. And that's what we want to look at today is this being intentional about walking in freedom and letting go and making room for God wants for what God wants to do. Because we have a tendency to hold on to things. Uh, our emotional condition can play a role in our life. But I believe today that God wants us to eliminate, to eliminate the things that are unnecessary. And so letting go is a part of eliminating things that are not necessary in our life. And so in Psalms 103, uh, verse 1, let's look at this. Familiar scripture. 
He says, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the evil, like the eagles. He says in verse, um, I'm going to look over at this in the Amplified here in verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit. Because you know, when you don't understand that we have this so great salvation and this forgiveness of our sins, our lives can be bound to living in the pit and to be stranded based on all the emotions and all of the areas of our life where the enemy can easily dwell and hide out in. So he says he redeems our life from the pit and corruption, who beautifies, dignifies, and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your mouth, your necessity and desire, at your personal age and situation with good so that your youth renewed is like the eagles, strong, overcoming, and soaring. So I wanna ask you today, are we harboring, are you harboring unforgiveness against someone? And that's where we want to begin today is just really understand this area of forgiveness and unforgiveness because we know that it is God's plan, it is one of his benefits that we just read. And he says, don't forget these benefits. He says, don't uh, allow these things to slip, to escape. He says, remember these benefits. And that first one here in verse Three is the fact that he is a forgiver. And he doesn't just forgive us of some things, but what does he say? He forgives us from all things, all thine iniquities, so that we can understand that as a result of what Jesus came to do, that we can operate in forgiveness. And so this isn't about putting pressure on ourselves to try to forgive somebody else by us reading the scriptures, but really understanding that forgiveness begins on the inside with us. And us realizing and recognizing that what God came to do is a finished work. And what he wants to do in our life is to cause us to experience good and to make room for walking in victory and moving forward and allowing our lives to be blessed and to experience the best life that he has for us. But you know what? If we don't understand this area, we can limit ourselves in many areas, and then the enemy comes in, and you know what he wants to do? He wants to rent space in your head. We allow him, through the spirit of unforgiveness, through holding grudges, to allow situations, things from our past, to cause us to think that those things are bigger than our God. And as a result, you know, the enemy can dwell there. What is it about unforgiveness? Why is it that it's so easy to hold on to? Because we think that that situation, that that circumstance has damaged us to the point that God can't do anything more in our lives. And so when we understand that it is through the precious blood of Jesus that we have all things and that we can live free and that we can live in a place of wholeness, and we can experience his best. How many of you know your past can't compare to the future that God has for you? But the enemy always, he always wants us to look back in the rearview mirror and think about, rehearse, nurse these things that have happened. Not to trivialize or minimize and to make it seem as if these things 
should be ignored, but to realize that God is greater and that God wants to do something powerful. And so we have to understand that we must not forget not the benefits that we have this morning, the benefits, the fact that we have forgiveness and he forgives us of all of our iniquities. And that word forgive means to grant free pardon. It means a remission of any offense or debt and to give up all claim. The word forgiveness, I'll say that again, to grant free pardon. Jesus granted us freedom. He pardoned us. He remitted all the things that we fell short in, remission of any offense or debt. That word forgiveness is to give up all claim. And it is a foundational principle to our Christian life. But you know what? It's also an area that causes entrapment in many areas of believers' lives. And so we want to look at some things this morning because it could be where we're holding on to something that a person did years ago and still upset about it. Do we spend a lot of time thinking about that person or that situation that hurt us? Wasting valuable space, taking up room in our head, living in our head, dominating our lives, controlling our lives, keeping us looking in the past, looking back, bringing up those same emotions from the past. And that's what we want to look at today. Look with me in Acts 26, verse 17, the book of Acts chapter 26. Because we need to make some decisions today that we're going to evict some folks out of our mind. Time for you to serve an eviction notice and kick out what needs to be eliminated from your life, from your heart the things that have kept you from when you see or you run in contact with that person and immediately all of the things from the past begin to resurrect in your life. I believe that God wants us to make room by letting go. It's time to make room this morning and let some things go. Let some people go. Because a lot of times we tie ourselves to people when we do not let things go. We're connecting ourselves with them and preventing the things that God wants us to experience, his goodness, by the thoughts and the actions and the shortcomings of, of where they were in their lives as well. And so, so many times we just focus in on, I got to forgive, I got to forgive, I got to forgive. But you know what? It becomes easier when we realize that, hey, I've been forgiven. And that same freedom that I've been forgiven of is so wonderful that I can allow that love to spill over into other people's lives because I understand that what they did cannot compare to what God wants to do in my life. Can't compare to what God has planned and destined for me from the foundations of the world. But the enemy wants you to drive in reverse all your life, thinking of, rehearsing, bringing back up all the things instead of realizing that though it is true, though it happened, but God is a deliverer. And God will make a way out of no way because he is God. Look at what he says here in Acts chapter 26, verse 16. It says, um, this was the apostle Paul while he was persecuting uh, people during that time, uh, harassing, troubling. So he says, um, 
And I said in verse 15, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Verse 16 says, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from people. You know what? Some of us just got to get delivered from people. Because as long as we are in bondage to people, they will continue to take up space in our life. What do they think? How many likes do I have? How many times have they said they love? And you know, social media has a way of doing that, creating this false sense, false security in areas of our life. But you know what? God wants us to be delivered from people. And not in a rude way, not in a way that is arrogant, but to understand that God establishes the identity on the inside of us. It is his affirmation, his love, his commitment for us, sending his son, dying for us, all of these things that enable us to walk in real deliverance and to walk in freedom. So he told the apostle Paul, he says, I am delivering thee from people. Delivering thee from people. You know, that's why people can easily live in our head. You know why? Because we're in bondage to what they think. We're so consumed with them in our thought life. And so they feel like they can have residence there, that they can abide there, that they have a place there. And we allow them to abide. But he says, delivering thee from people. He says here in verse 17. And uh, he says in the Amplified, choosing you from among this Jew Jewish people and the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. Uh, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. If you would, let me read this from the Amplified. It says, to open their eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may thus receive forgiveness. I'm telling you, when you understand that you've been forgiven, I'm telling you, you'll allow other people to experience that same forgiveness. But when we become so hard on ourselves, and we really don't believe that Jesus has forgiven us of all of our sins, and we're constantly putting pressure on ourselves to perform, to be pleasing to God, then you know what? We'll put that same pressure on other people. And they can never measure up just like we think we can never measure up. But he says here that he is delivering us and releasing us from the power of Satan to God so that they may thus receive forgiveness and release. I mean, you know, it's time for release. Glory be to God. Time to release things in your life. Release people in your life. Release what was done to you. Release the abuse. Release the trauma. Release the tragedy. Release your past. Release what they said. Release what they did. So he says, it is a release from their sins and a place and portion among those who are consecrated and purified by faith in me. And so forgiveness opens the door for us walking in our inheritance today, for us getting a hold of all the things that are in his will as heirs of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ when we understand the miraculous power of forgiveness, it gives us this ability to receive our inheritance. But you know what? It's something about holding on 
to unforgiveness, holding on to resentment, holding on to bitterness and the things of the past, it prevents you from experiencing the inheritance that God has for you. It prevents you from discovering the depths and the wonder of his love. Because unforgiveness, it moves in. And you know what? It's going to bring his cousin strife, and it's going to bring his nephew uh, envy and jealousy and his niece and all kinds of things. You know what? You look up, they have taken over your life, taken over your heart, taken over your mind. And eventually it takes over your body because, I mean, you know, that opens the door to unhealthy living. It opens the door to sickness and disease and depression and cancer, a heart attack, uh, all kinds of things, stress, hypertension. And so we must realize that God wants us to experience his inheritance, which is health and healing, deliverance, wholeness in our spirit, our soul, and in our mind. Well, we can think clearly, we can think soberly, and we can walk in love, and we can begin to be the church that God wants us to be because we have a revelation of his love for us. We know that we have been forgiven. Glory be to God. We receive his forgiveness for everything. And then as a result, we know it was because of his love, his great love towards us. And he loved us so much that he sent his son to forgive us and to cause us to be delivered and to have an inheritance. Look over at Luke chapter 7. I love this parable here. It talks about this woman who had a sketchy reputation. She made a lot of mistakes and she as the Bible was described as a notorious woman, one who had a past of doing things that were not right, probably some immoral things. But it's interesting in how Jesus dealt with her and how Jesus dealt with people who had a past or in some instances who maybe the world would say are shady or people in the church would say shady. But you know what? Look at what the Scripture says here in Luke 7, 47, this woman who came to Jesus and who he allowed to minister to him. Uh, Verse 47, uh, we'll back up a little bit. Look over at uh, verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, which are many, are forgiven. Many sins which are forgiven for She loved much, for she loved much. And you know why she loved much? Because of all the things that Jesus forgave her of, all the opportunities that he could have excluded her and kept her out. Because when we look back here in verse 36, skip up for a second, Uh, to verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster 
box. The scripture says in the Amplified that she was an especially wicked sinner. But you know what? She loved Jesus. She loved much. You know why? Because she had been forgiven of much. She realized all the things that she had done, all the mistakes that she had passed, made, all the things that she had come short in and the shortcomings and the failures of her past. But you know what? Jesus allowed her to minister by bringing that alabaster box and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And look at verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had hidden him saw it, or had bitten him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. But you know what? Jesus wasn't thinking about that. He wasn't thinking about the fact that she had committed sins and she was a sinner. He says, I have come for the sinners. I have come for those who need to be delivered. I have come for those who are in bondage. I have come for those who are especially wicked. That is why I am here, to bring the release, to bring the deliverance, to drop the charges, to release the claims, to recognize that I forgive you, and because I forgive you, woman, you forgive yourself, and go and be free and be whole, because this is your day the day when the free favors of God will abound, the day when God's goodness will overtake your life, the day when you can begin to walk and experience the goodness that God has for your life. And I'm telling you today, when we understand that we have been forgiven of much, we can love much. So we as the church, we must ask ourselves, Why is it hard to love? Why are we being mean? Why are we being just in a place where God's love isn't shown? Because we don't understand that we have been forgiven. That we understand that we are the body of Christ. We have been loved by God. We are the object of his affection. We are the focus of his delight. We are the redeemed, the peculiar, the chosen, the loved, the cherished, the nourished. We are who God says we are. And you know what? We can begin to walk in freedom. And we can go before Jesus and go before his word and go before his presence and pour out our hearts and minister to him like she did. And you know, there were those who were trying to figure out what was going on. And then he says in verse 40, And Jesus answered and said unto Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he says, Say on. There was a creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500, the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Jesus asked, Tell me therefore which of them will love him the most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he says unto him, thou has rightly judged. I don't know about you. I don't stand here today as if I have been perfect or I haven't experienced shortcomings in my past, made mistakes. But you know what? I focus on the fact that I have been forgiven and I have been given the opportunity to have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? If we don't have a revelation of his love and we don't understand what he's done on the inside of us, then it's easy to hold on and to keep that same tenant in our head, 
keeping that same stronghold in our minds, maintaining the harbored resentment and the unforgiveness and the grudge, but there's something about meditating on the love of God, meditating on what he has done for us. Even when you think about Joseph, Joseph was one who went through a lot. I won't turn there for the sake of time, but his brothers were envious of him. His brothers were jealous of him. But you know what? It caused Joseph to really experience breakthrough in his life because he realized who he was, and he realized what God had done and how God had favored him. Look at Genesis 50, verse 19. I think this will be a good time for us to just kind of focus on how Joseph even dealt with his family, how he dealt with his siblings, because sometimes it's the people who we're the most closest to that can hurt us the most. And so you know that the fact that Joseph was sold into slavery by his own siblings, that he had to work through some things. And I love his life and the example that he sets for us. Because unforgiveness is not what we want to maintain in our lives. Uh, before we read Joseph's story, let's look at a couple things here. Four ways to detect unforgiveness in our heart. Number one, unforgiveness always keeps the score. Keeping score, the tally, the record of what was done, that's number two. All, unforgiveness always boasts of its own record. Records of what happened and records of what transpired, transgression. Unforgiveness always complains. Number four, un unforgiveness is always envious, and unforgiveness opens the door to jealousy. But look at what Joseph did here. Let's see how he dealt with it. And I encourage you to just kind of study his life and the times where he was tested. He says here, uh, this was after his brothers had come, and uh, verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, and they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require us all the evil which we did unto him, they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive I pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. I'm sure he was hurt. I'm sure he had a lot of emotional things that were going on when it says that Joseph wept. The half is not told, the degree of the things that this man had gone through to the point that it brought him to tears and him seeing what was transpiring at that moment. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And look at what Joseph says unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? He says in the Amplified, vengeance is his, not mine. He says, I'm not in the place of God to determine and dictate what's going to happen to you. He says, vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to me. Am I in the place of God? Do I detect your future? Do I determine what's going to happen with you? Am I standing in the place of God? He didn't give room to unforgiveness. He recognized that it was God who would have the final say-so. 
He says, am I standing in the place of God? But you know what? When we hold on to unforgiveness, we're standing in that place where we want to determine what happens. And God says, let it go. It's not worth it. Let go of the scorecard. Put it down. Stop and begin to recognize that it is God who has a final decision. And God will do what needs to be done in the lives of others. It is our responsibility to receive the forgiveness and to re recognize that the love that God has for us, it makes us give. It's not to for sale, for give. That we are to give as a result of what we have received. And because we understand that, we don't try to dictate and hold back and hold people for what they did to us. But we're not standing in that place of God. Because what God wants to do in my future is far better than what you could ever do to me in my past. My future is bright. My future is promising. My future is just a wonderful thing. So I choose not to dwell there not in the place of God, to say, because of what you did, I can never get to what God has for me. Absolutely not. I open my heart. I open my mind. I open myself up to God possibilities, to God happenings, God encounters, whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. But I refuse to live in the past. I refuse to allow unforgiveness to dwell and rent space in my head, resentment to live and dwell in my head. Absolutely not. I set my will to forgive. Sometimes you got to pre-forgive. When you wake up in the morning, Lord, I just set my will. I don't know what the enemy has devised or tried to come for me with, but you know what? I set my will to forgive. Set my will to forgive. And so we have to get in this place where we forgive ourselves. To forgive ourselves. This is so important. And I'm running out of time. I'm just going to uh, kind of bring this to a point where we can just pray and we can meditate on what has been shared because we're never going to develop greatness inside of us as long as we develop excuses and alibis of why we are confined to what somebody did to us. Never going to get to greatness. As long as we hold on, hang on, make room, we didn't carve out, the room is just furnished. I mean, from top to bottom. That's what they did, and this is their room, and I'm telling you, Come here to my room and sit with me and hear all the details of what happened. Instead of clearing out that room, let it go, move on. Get out of my life. Get out of here, unforgiveness. Get out of here, resentment. Get out of here, bitterness. Get out of here. And letting God move in that room and letting him heal us. Letting him make us whole. Letting us experience all the things that he wants to speak to us because we've eliminated and we've let go of the past and we've made up in our mind that we are the loved of God and there is no fear in love and as a result of God's love for us we know who we are and we believe his plan for us forgiveness frees us from the choices of other people the choices that other people make who are we to hold something against someone that God doesn't even hold against them? There's no need to hold a grudge against someone who has hurt us because in essence what we are saying is what they did is more powerful than what God can do in my life. 
We are mad because we think this person has control over us. We think that they will hinder us. They will keep us back. They will prevent God's best in our life. We fail to think that God is greater than what they did. And you know what? I'm going to say this, and we got to close. Sometimes God lets people disappoint us. You know why? Because it forces us to look to him. It's good teaching in here. Because we are so concerned and in consumption with what they are and what they did and who we think they are and the source of who and have and what we are and makes us feel like this is what we need. But you know what? God says, I'm going to let you experience this. Because maybe that's the only way you'll take your eyes off them and you'll look to me. Because we're going to disappoint. We're human. I ate Creflo's lunch yesterday. <laughs> I'm human. He's like, wait, 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 why you eat my lunch? I'm like, I don't know. I just ate it. I just, it looked good. I <laughs> Humans, we're going to disappoint. We're going to disappoint each other. You know, we're going to do things that's going to disappoint ourselves. We're going to do things that will disappoint God. But you know what? He never does things that disappoint us. He is that committed to his word being manifested in our life. And so, if nothing else, this causes us to look to God, the healer, the helper, our shield, the finisher of our faith, to keep our attention on him and stop trying to make other people show up in our lives like we want to show up in their lives. Look to God. Look to him. And understand that it is his goodness, it is his grace that we receive. When we receive that grace on the inside of us, you know, it's enables us to extend that same grace to ourselves and that grace that we can in turn eventually pour out to other people. But you know, it begins with us today as we begin to pray. Thank you, Lord. Say this with me. I decide today to forgive myself from falling short and failing from self-sabotage and self-hatred that I've allowed to happen. Today, I let go of feelings that have damaged and caused me to feel unworthy and inadequate. I forgive myself for not being a better person. I forgive myself for not being uh, the best spouse, parent, child, and Christian. Today, I let go of the guilt for the times that I've let myself down and the times that I've let others down. I forgive my family members that have let me down with anger, with insensitivity, with their selfishness, with their fears, and with their addictions. Today I am letting go of the painful memories so I can remember the times they, they were just my family. I forgive people who said they would be my friend, but they disappeared. They disappointed. Today I let go of the anger so I can make room for the new, so I can make room 
for the fresh so I can make room for clarity, so I can make room for peace. Today I let go so I can make room for God. I forgive myself for the selfish choices that I've made that have hurt me and hurt others. I forgive myself for not being the best version of myself and robbing people of the beauty of who I could have been. By forgiving myself this day, I become the best version of me. I give myself the gift of letting go. The gift of letting go. All the regret, the resentment, unforgiveness, I give myself the gift of letting go, of making room for what God wants to do this day, this moment, this time, this season in my life. I make room right now for what God has planned for my life. I forgive those who let me down. You know why? Because Jesus lifts us up. And make up in your mind, I am not going to be a victim anymore. I'm not going to be a victim anymore. Thank you, Lord. I give myself that gift right now. We worship you. We let go. We make room. We thank you, Father, that you are quick to forgive. We receive it right now in Jesus' name so that we can be the best version of who you've created us to be. No longer bound by our fears, by our past, by what happened. Thank you, Lord. Right now in Jesus' name, we receive that. If you've not received Jesus as your Lord and as your personal Savior, it begins by accepting him into your life, making room for him to come in and be the Lord of your life, being your master, uh, taking authority over your life, surrendering your will to his will. It begins by a decision. I receive his forgiveness. I receive his deliverance. I receive what has been purchased for me from the foundations of the world. My past, present, future sins, it's all under the blood of the lamb that was slain thousands of years ago. So say this with me, Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Save me. And when you move in, I know I'll experience your best. Thank you for saving me right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to text the keyword I'm saved, one word to 51555. There are some things that we want to bless you with, some things that we want to sow into your life so that you can get on this path of living a successful, victorious life. Christian life, and it begins by having the foundation of God's love on the inside of you and knowing who you are in Him. Let's go ahead and receive our offering this morning. Let's complete our worship, and um, we give today out of our love to God. We give out of our surplus. We give out of our adoration because we know that we can't beat God's giving. He is such a giver that he sent his son uh, so that we could have everlasting life and that we can experience the Zoe life, that we could live 
with our needs met and that we could be blessed and be a blessing to those preventing misfortune in the lives of others. So understand that as you give to this ministry, you are giving and preventing misfortune in the lives of people. We are so thankful that even earlier this morning, we were having the opportunity to bless people with food. You know, as a result of this pandemic, food security became so important, so paramount in the lives of people. Just having food to eat and to prevent starvation and hunger so we thank you so much for just giving out of your overflow and giving towards the kingdom of God so that we can be a blessing and bring others into relationship. Sometimes it's just through food that you can create a relationship with someone by meeting their needs, giving them a bag of groceries. And then you can sow the word of God because they realize that you've been able to meet their physical need. So we thank you so much for your generosity this morning. We don't take it for granted, and we are so uh, in expectation for God's harvest to return back to your life. So you have four ways you can give. You can text World Changers plus the amount to 74483. You can call 1-866-477-7683. You can mail it in, 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia, 30349, or you can go to either website, worldchangers.org or creflodollarministries.org. But these are different ways that you can give, and I think you can even give with PayPal. But by all means, let's begin to live under an open heaven where his blessings are poured out. We don't have enough room to receive. And as we give... He returns it back to us. As we give, he gives back to us. As we give, he gives back to us. And there's this ongoing cycle of provision. I believe it can happen for you today. And so thank you for tuning in. I trust that you were blessed. And my prayer is that you will enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you. Bye-bye.